Welcome to the celebration of you. I'm your host, Holly Dowling. I'm thrilled to share with you incredible people from all over the world who are living and leading extraordinary lives. From overcoming immense adversity to discovering the secret sauce to leading with courage and grace, their stories are going to bring you hope and inspiration. Now, let the stories begin. Hi, everybody, and welcome back to the celebration of you. And so excited, as always, that I get to introduce you to incredible people that I've been so blessed to meet all over the world, and sometimes in the craziest times and places. And you know I'm a fan of serendipity. You never know who you're going to meet, so be open. So get ready, because for everyone out there, and I mean, we're in over 100 countries, 150 listeners around the world, and I thank you. This person you're about to meet goes back to somewhat of the beginning of podcasting. And I've never had the opportunity to interview a founder of a company that actually creates and helps people get on podcasts. So welcome, Margie Feldhune. Hi, love. Hi, Holly. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. And we do have to tell everybody, right? Like, Right. It was crazy. We met um, in July at a fabulous event that Carrie Murphy was doing. And right. And we were like, yes. oh, and you and we'll hear more about your partner, Jessica, your business partner. And we yes. ended up like hanging out and well, like always having a little bit too much wine and great conversation. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, so many things that I want to tap into because Margie, you really touched my heart when I got to know you at a personal level, sitting around the fire pit. And I would like to start with, tell everybody about Interview Connections and tell us about this business that you and Jessica have and why you started it. I want to start there. Okay. Okay. Absolutely. Interview Connections, we are the leading guest booking agency for entrepreneurs. So we book entrepreneurs on podcasts to get them in front of their target audience so they can get new clients and so they can get their message out there and have a larger impact. We were the first in the space in 2013, which doesn't seem old, but in internet years, especially in podcast years, that was very early to be doing this. And actually my business partner, Jessica founded the business. Her dad is a business coach and she left her job because she was having a baby And he said, you can be a virtual assistant. I'll be your first client. And he really saw the vision for podcast guesting even in 2013. And he, one of the things he had her doing when she was working from home with her new baby was booking him on podcasts. And he said, you know, you should niche down and sell this service to more people. So that's how Interview Connections was born. And Jessica really created an industry in 2013 that, that didn't exist. Now, fast forward we've seen a lot more people spring up, a lot of whom are, you know, former contractors of interview connections or former clients and which is fine. There's plenty of space for everybody, but it's been, it's an honor to lead in the space and to continue to innovate and have such a high touch service. And we're different in a lot of ways. And this always surprises people. We have an in-house staff of employees in an office. (laughs) <laughs> wait, wait. I love the way you just paused <laughs> when you said that. <laughs> yes. Because I know a lot of online entrepreneurs <laughs> gasp in horror. <laughs> <laughs> But (laughs) we, so we work with our clients virtually. We work with successful seven and eight figure entrepreneurs all over the world, booking them on podcasts. And we keep our staff in house. They're full-time employees. We're all in Rhode Island. And the reason we do this is because we know that having real people who are available, who you can call, who we can train and develop to become leaders in our company is the only way for our model to be sustainable and for us to deliver the best possible service to our clients. I love that. And you know what? I didn't realize that. Like I'm literally sitting here smiling because you said that with such a profound, passionate 
voice, the vernacular of, and this is why we do what we do. I love that. (laughs) I know. Well, it's not a popular move with a lot of um, online businesses and agency models because contractors are obviously a lot easier. You can avoid payroll taxes. You don't need an HR person. Um, But we really are very confident in our reasons for using in-house employees and the results really in the quality of the service have shown us that it was the right move. And also we have a wonderful staff. I mean, it's, it's great to work with them in person. It really is. Well, and you know what I love? I, I just don't want anybody to miss this and let's, and granted your clients are all over the world, right? So your clientele yeah. base is virtual. We are in such a virtual digital place in this world right now that we are losing the touch of human beings and face-to-face communication. And in that respect, I love that your team is full-time with you being present. There's something really special about that. You don't see that as much right now. And I think that's kind of like, I'm passionate about a handwritten note. Yes. Right. We're so Mm -hmm. far past that, that when you receive a handwritten note, and I do this when I do, and I speak with leaders, whether it's huge events or small ones, I'm always like, take the time and send a handwritten note. People will be blown away, right? Blown away. Yes. Um, I love that. And we tell our clients the same thing um, after they're a guest on a podcast to send a thank you and a handwritten note if possible, because yeah, people really are blown away and it has such an incredible impact. Yeah. I love that. And I love that you're encouraging the people that you're getting on shows, like getting somebody on my show, you know, to say, Hey, be grateful, just send a note. Oh, I love that. Okay. So this is, so let's do a quick celebration moment for you (laughs) and Jessica, because right before we started the interview, I got to find out you had, and I'm going to brag on you, your first seven figure year this past year in 2019. And we have to give a shout out to our dear, wonderful, precious, beautiful, brilliant friend, Allie Brown, who has been really helpful in helping you do that right? Yes. Oh, absolutely. Thank you so much. And Allie Brown and her premier group, and she has a great podcast called Glambition Radio um, for people to check out if they don't already listen. And it is all about who you know. You know, it's this network. You begin to meet amazing people and you begin to have these amazing connections and it's always be open to who's going to be in your life, right? And then be willing to walk through a new door. And, And the other thing that you and Jessica have done so brilliantly is you're really coachable and you've been really eager to say, we're stepping out of fear and we're going to go after this. We can do this. And just meeting the two of you, I had so much fun meeting you and knowing that like you did this, it it happened. And I, Oh, I just had to celebrate that. And because we have such a beautiful common friend and I feel like it's important to never forget who's been there to help you through the good times and the bad. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. All right. So now I want to go, my biggest part of the show is going back to the backstory. You know, when people see great success and they hear great success, they always wonder, oh, what could you have possibly been through? Right. And part of why I started this show was simply because I feel like I get to meet incredible people like yourself who, who the world sees as, wow, look what you're doing and all this success. What people don't know is when we've gone through really challenging times, we've faced adversity, right? And it could have been very dark times. You've overcome it and you're doing something to help other people. That's extraordinary. So I would love to know, take us back to a really pivotal moment for you. Maybe it goes back to when you were really young. Maybe it goes back not that far ago, but I know you've had some pivotal experiences in your life that have really shaped who you are. So will you share with us, Margie? I would love to. So I'm going to take us back to 2015. I had graduated from college and then decided I'm passionate about travel. And I decided I wanted to live in another culture that I had never even visited. So I ended up narrowing it down to Asia and then Taiwan. So I moved to Taiwan for two years. I moved there in 2013 to teach English. (laughs) Um, Not because I'm an especially good teacher, I'll be (laughs) honest with you, but because that was the easiest way to get paid to live in another country, which seemed like heaven. Mm. So in 2015, I had been in Taiwan for about two years and I had never left my parents for this long. I'm an only child, very close to both my parents. Um, I even, I mean, I'm from Rhode Island. I went to college in Rhode Island. I really didn't 
I moved out, but I didn't really go far from the nest. And so being away from my parents for two years was really hard, especially during the holidays and stuff like that. So this was a very different experience for me to be living in this new culture. And it definitely was lonely, um, but it was also an incredible experience. And I was really grateful to be there. That's a really huge leap. Like you chose to do something because you wanted to get out of your little bubble, basically. And do yes. something different, right? I mean, and tell me if you don't mind around, you don't have to give us the exact age, but how old were you around then? So I was 26 in 2015. Okay. I know exactly how old I was and I'll tell you why. Okay. Keep going because <laughs> I want people to know. Yes, yes, it did. Yes. Okay. So I, I moved to Taiwan when I was 24 and then two years later, um, in 2015, I'm 26 and still in Taiwan. And something I should tell you is both my parents are incredible people, very brilliant, very kind, very fair. They're both successful lawyers who love animals, and I'm very proud of both of them. But I did grow up in a home with a lot of mental illness, primarily depression and also hoarding. And this is something that until shows like, you know, sh the shows about hoarding started coming up, yeah. I didn't know that this was a thing that had a name or that anyone could relate to it. I just knew that something was not right in the house and I felt a lot of shame and I wanted to hide it from the world. So I never had people over. I would come up with excuses constantly to keep people out of my house. And my parents worked really hard to send me to private schools. They cared a lot about education. So I was in school with a lot of affluent kids with successful parents and they all had these gorgeous houses that were perfect and they had a cleaning person. Mm. And I was like, they cannot see where I'm living. I was so embarrassed and I wanted to protect my parents from other people's judgment. And again, my parents were successful people, kind people. These aren't, you know, right. maybe what you would picture. And it's hoarding affects a lot more people than I, than I think most of us realize. So I had decided while I was in Taiwan that when I got home, I was going to clean my parents' house. And this is one of the first times that I really said this, I took on something big. I said, this is really big task. I'm going to do it. And I started, I had been reading the secret. So I started using the law of attraction and writing gratitude and writing affirmations for two years every day. I'm going to clean the house. I'm going to clean my parents' house. I'm going to do it. So two years of this gratitude and being grateful for my parents and grateful for their health and grateful for this clean house that I could see so clearly in my mind. And in January 2015, after two years of this, I got home from my teaching job and my partner at the time said, you need to call your mom. And when you have parents who are still married and someone says, not call your parents, but call your mom. Oh, Marty, it, I'm just covered in goosebumps. It's right shocking. Now. And yeah. he looked very pale. So I was trying to get reassurance. I said, what happened? I mean, how bad is this? Is this the worst thing that could possibly happen? And he didn't reassure me. So at that point, I don't want to walk to the desk and Skype my mom. It's 5 a.m. where she is. <laughs> So this is definitely not a casual call, um, but I, I didn't have a choice. I, I wanted to just like escape this moment and not make that call. But at that point, things were moving forward and I couldn't stop it. So I had to open up Skype and call my mom. Um, and at this point, I am thinking something's happened to my dad because he said, call your mom. And, you know, he'd have been having some heart problems. So I'm like, oh my gosh, he had a heart attack or he was in a car accident. He's in the hospital. And I Skype my mom and she picks up the call and I said, hi mom, what's going on? And she said, dad's dead. He killed himself. Those were her words. She does. She's a federal prosecutor and does not mince words. <laughs> oh, Margie, I, I'm just sitting here covered in goosebumps right now. I mean, you'd been doing two years of abundance work to come home and clean the house. You had no idea what was yes. about to come into your life and happen. 
Yes, exactly. And and I really was worried about my dad because of the the mild heart problem. So I'm also doing all this abundance work on my dad's health. And I had all these ideas like I'm going to get him to do a 5K with me and I'm going to help him train so he'll have a goal. It'll motivate him to get healthier. I mean, this is what I'm visualizing every single day for two years. I I'm just breathless right now. I mean, I know you've been through some stuff, but right now... I'm hearing what you really faced at that moment. Can you remember, you probably know exactly where you were standing when you were Skyping your mom, right? You know exactly yes. what you were wearing. You could probably feel, tell us, cause there's a lot of people that are dealing with family members, you know, suicide is at an exponential rate right now. What was yes. your immediate, what happened to you in that moment? Well, I think the shock takes over. I, like I said, I'm so close to my parents. I'm an only child. And I, I have had that morbid thought many times before this. Oh, um, I don't know what I would do if my parents died. I couldn't handle it. You know, and I think we all do that of like, oh, I can't even imagine. I don't know how people who've been through this get up in the morning. But when it really does happen, first of all, there's shock. So my whole body just got cold. And I immediately went into, what can I do? So I immediately was focused on my mom because yeah. she had struggled with depression as well. So I'm like, okay, I've lost my dad. Let's make sure I'm not going to lose my mom too. So I'm like, okay, I'm here with you. Is everything okay? And it was honestly surprising to me that I went into such a protective mode of wanting to protect my mom and help her because I want to be honest with you guys. You can hear that and be like, wow, Margie, like you're such an angel. I was not. I was an entitled child and a spoiled brat. <laughs> well, at least you're honest, Margie. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I really was. My Because my parents had their struggles with mental health, one of the only ways my dad could really show love was gifts. He would buy me things. And I really was his little princess. We were very close, but I was a brat. I was very focused on myself and wanting to clean the house was the first thing outside myself and really helping others besides helping animals, which I'd always been passionate about. And it was really incredible how it brought out honestly a better side of me mm. to go through something like that and to really see outside myself and how I needed to protect my family at that point and what I had left of my family. That's a really beautiful and very, very profound thing that you experienced, that you could have such high self-awareness to, to now be able to see that as I got out of self, you know? Yeah. And so take us to, you know, what happened next? Like how soon were you there with your mom? Like what, what transpired? I needed to... Um, make an international move. So I had to sell everything. And for tax reasons, I needed to spend a few more weeks in Taiwan to close everything out and file my taxes because it had to be done in, in person. And I wasn't sure when I would be back. Um, and then I had been planning this trip in Southeast Asia before I left. I was going to travel for a month and then go home. And I was doing a lot of stuff remotely, but it got to a point where there was nothing really left that I needed to do. I had people go pick up, you know, my dad's pets and foster them. And Jess was actually one of those people, which is how we reconnected. Mm. But I, I don't know why I made this decision and people who are grieving make bizarre decisions. I decided to still do this trip to Cambodia and the Philippines and then go home after that. So that's what I did because I knew as soon as I got home, it would be nonstop and I would be cleaning the house and dealing with everything and helping my mom. And she was living with a friend. So I was like, okay, stay with your friend for a month. I'm going to do this trip and then come home. I have no idea why I did this trip, hmm. Hmm. but that's the choice I made. And then I got home and we did the memorial and I I did the eulogy and then I started cleaning the house. And that was the biggest project I had ever taken on in my life. Even if I hadn't been newly bereaved and dealing with that, it would have been incredibly challenging. But my entire life as an entrepreneur came out of that house clean because that project was the ultimate startup. It was seemingly impossible, a gigantic six bedroom house 
You can't imagine the condition. I had to learn how to hire, how to find the right experts, how to pivot when someone left unexpectedly and I still needed work from them, how to become the expert when I lost somebody who was helping me. Mm. I mean, it, it was everything I needed to learn to be a successful entrepreneur. You know what's fascinating? And I'm literally sitting here with my eyes closed, listening to, you know, <clears throat> I love that you just said, I don't know why I chose to make that trip, but you chose to still do it. Looking back, you did the right thing because you would never have taken that trip. Cambodia no. would never have happened. And you knew, oh, I've got the goosies. You knew that you were going to be spending the minute you got back a lot of time cleaning out a house, helping your mom, right? You knew where your life was going to be. So you were, had that clear vision and you knew because you've been doing the work and visualizing it. I have to ask you because I know this show, Hoarding and Buried Alive, I feel like it's giving people help. Yes. I, I feel like this is a disease that is rooted in mental health. People, innocent, wonderful, beautiful people don't mean to want to live like that. It is such a, it's the, the bandaid or it's what's showing up and manifesting of deep, you know, mental health issues. And to think that I've seen that show many times and to think you lived it and out of shame, never wanted people over. But Margie, when you think about cleaning out that house, six bedrooms, was it close to what that show was like? I mean, is this how it was in your home? It was similar. Yeah. It was not the most like extreme hoarding case, but it was very extreme. And there was also pets in the house. So without going into too much detail, um, there were cats, some, two of them were my cats that I had brought home and then some other cats. Most of the cats were my fault. I have a problem with bringing home stray animals. <laughs> I know, but that's not a problem. You love it. You love yes. it. <laughs> but so not only was it the amount of stuff there, but also there was cat pee everywhere, which is incredibly hard to clean. So I needed to get a gigantic dumpster. That was the first step of cleaning. And I filled that dumpster. I mean, it took five months all day, every day, I would get up at 5 a.m. And then I would like collapse at 9 p.m. And then start over. I took one day off in five months because my friend was in town. Um, and honestly, the house clean was my entire life. It got to the point where I was afraid to leave the house. I didn't even know how to talk to people anymore because my world got so small. All I was doing was cleaning the house. And you know, I don't think anybody listening could truly appreciate or understand what that's like unless you've been there. To truly be doing for five months and only take one day off, you lost all communication. The, I have to ask two questions. Do you feel that you can look back on this time and it was all, this was really therapeutic to help you get through the loss of your father? Did this help it or did it make it really worse? That's a great question. I think the ability to physically process his stuff actually was a gift. It was very sad. There were certain parts that were sadder than others. But overall, I do think physically processing that stuff and purging it and sorting it and throwing stuff in the dumpster and keeping some stuff aside was very therapeutic. The parts that were the most sad, I will say I cleaned out his car and there were lottery tickets, Powerball tickets, so many of them dating up to really the day before he took his own life. So to see that he was still trying to turn things around and to to have some type of big win or transformation in his life up until that last day was very heartbreaking. But overall, it was a gift. And honestly, my dad was a wonderful person and I was honored to be able to do that for him. Mm. What a, you're such a beautiful person. Oh, I am just sitting here like, no wonder I loved you the minute I met you. And the moment we sat and you actually mentioned something and I, I would like everybody to hear this, but this is also how, when you said, this is when Jessica came back in my life, we reconnected and now you guys are business partners. Um, can, yes. you, can you give us a little flavor of how that went down? I love that story. It was all meant to be. Absolutely. So 
We had been connected. My first job out of college, I majored in double majored in Latin and studio art. So I could not get a job. <laughs> so I was That's a great major. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. It was like, my mom was like, wow, a double major. It's like you doubled your chances of being unemployed. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is awesome. <laughs> Which ended up, it ended up working out, but the job I could get, I found on Craigslist and it was door-to-door -door fundraising for a nonprofit, an environmental nonprofit. So I you know, applied, they called me, I went in for an interview and Jess is the person who interviewed me. So we first met because we were both door-to-door -door fundraisers, which is the best sales training you could possibly get. And I left that job after about nine months to go travel the world because I was saving money so that I could move to Asia. She went a, a very different path and she got married and she had babies and we stayed connected on Facebook and it, we were connected, but I wasn't really seeing her posts or anything like that. Um, and it was actually because I posted on my Facebook from Taiwan out of desperation because I had all these pets at the house and my mom's like, I'm so overwhelmed. I can't take care of these animals. So I posted on Facebook and asked people local if they would be able to go pick up a pet and foster it until I could get home and figure out a long-term solution. And she was one of the people who commented and said, Hey, I'll pick, I'll pick up a pet. <laughs> and honestly, <laughs> it was the most helpful thing. It was my first win. It was the first thing that went right was just being able to take my dad's cat kitten who she ended up adopting. She still has kitten. And that was how we reconnected. And there was so much trust and loyalty there that when I came on as a contractor and then as the first employee of Interview Connections, we were so in it together and we had so much loyalty and we're so bonded, especially by what happened with Kitten, that it was like we were partners from the beginning, even when we weren't on paper partners. I love this story so much. This is the one that I, I'm covered in goosies again, because look at how your life has transpired. Look at how somebody came back in your life and look at what you two are doing. I mean, you two are doing something that is truly impacting lives and you are making a difference for people. And you know what you said a little while ago that I don't want anybody to miss is you said, I feel like everything I went through was truly about learning how to be an entrepreneur. You had to get in there, right? In the grit yeah. and do it. And that's that's the joys and the, the not so fun joys of being an entrepreneur. And you can do it. You know what you're capable of. Yes. Oh, oh I just adore you. Oh, I just, you know, I, we could just keep going and going. You know, like, and okay, so I have to ask you one final question. Two things that I'd love to know. And one is being that you shared, and I really appreciate you being so transparent and authentic about what you went through with your father and, and, you know, your mom and dad, because mental health and depression is so rampant. And finally, we're starting to talk about it. It used to be shoved under the carpet, right? People wouldn't talk about it. Like we talk about cancer. Um, but we're now talking about it. Is there anything that you've taken away from this experience that you could share with a listener that might be dealing with being a child of parents at battle, you know, mental health, depression, maybe they have a sibling or a friend. I mean, anything at all, not that you're the expert, but just from what you've experienced. The biggest thing that I would say, first of all, is you are not alone. And my favorite quote is the Mother Teresa quote, find someone who believes that he's alone and convince him that he's not. And that's, I think that's my mission on this planet. That's why I love podcasts, especially your show, Holly. So really what I would want them to know is that they're not alone. Mm. Oh, and that is so simple. And people need to be reminded of that. You know, in my meditation and prayer time this morning, I have to tell you that I always pray and ask for whatever I need to know. And what came over me and literally washed right through me was, I always love to love. It's to help people love unconditionally and uncritically. When you can be loved unconditionally and uncritically, you don't feel alone. Wouldn't you feel, wouldn't you agree? Yes. Yeah. Like it's just all serendipitous right now, what you just said. Well, my friend, um, and one more thing, because I would just love to know, going back to that younger 20-year-old self, and maybe it was the 24-year-old self that took off and went to Thailand, um, 
What advice would you give her based on all that you've been through and experienced since then and who you are today? I would say calm down and trust that things are unfolding for you. I had a lot of anxiety about not living up to my potential and I would get jobs and then I'd learn the job and then I'd get so bored and quit. And I just couldn't really get my footing and find success. And honestly, I've struggled with my own mental health issues with um, anxiety, OCD and depression. So I really was struggling in a lot of ways, but I wish that I could tell myself not to worry so much and to just have faith that things are unfolding and the stuff that seems like it's taking you off course or is taking you backwards or the stuff that's really painful, it is your path. Mm -hmm. Oh, I love that you just gave that nugget. And that's what you are. That would be the advice because in the darkest times, we see it as sometimes the most challenging and the ugliest and, and worst times. They can be the greatest gifts when we can yes. grow from them and become who we were meant to be. And you are, and you and Jessica are doing such incredible things. I absolutely love having you in my life. I love that we are connected for the rest of our lives, girlfriend. Did you catch that? <laughs> Yay. I'm so glad Holly. <laughs> well, will you do me a favor and share with everybody? You're also, I have to give you another shout out before we wrap up. You are, because you've mentioned it a couple of times, you are passionate about rescuing animals. You were recognized in 2019 as the Humane Hero Award. And you also, who knows how many animals you have right now, but um, it is your passion. <laughs> and I love that about you. Can you tell people how best can they reach out to learn more about you and learn more about interview connections if they'd like to um, learn more about your business? Absolutely. So interviewconnections.com is our website. And if you are an entrepreneur who's looking to leverage podcast interviews or just learn more about how to do that, we have a great free Facebook group called the Guest Expert Profit Lab. You can send a member request. There's a couple questions to fill out there. And we do amazing live trainings in there. Jess and I are in there at least every week, interacting live and giving tips on how you can leverage the strategy, how you can get out there on more shows. And if you're not an entrepreneur, feel free to just send me an email. If you're someone who's heard this interview and can relate or just want to check in with someone who understands you and not feel alone, you can send me an email at Margie, M-A-R-G-Y at interviewconnections.com. You are such a priceless gem. Thank you for offering that and for being an angel on assignment in our world, my friend. Of course. Thank you so much, Holly. I loved having you. And now you have to go make sure to tell Jess I said hi. Promise? I definitely will. I promise. <laughs> okay. Oh, thank you, my friend, for being here. Oh. Thank you so much, Holly. Have a great rest of your day. You too. Thank you for joining me for another awesome celebration of you. If you were inspired by this story, please share it with your family and friends and hashtag your story matters. I'd love to hear from you. So please leave a comment on iTunes and absolutely please come to my website, hollydowling.com. Leave a comment there too. And while you're there, pick up your free gift. Most importantly though, just remember that your life is a gift from God. What you do with it is your gift back. Thank you.